I'm Lauren. Uh, I'm an open source developer at the Guild, and I'm from Germany. And today I'm here to talk about the evolution of graphical code generation. And when I mean graphical code generation, what I'm actually talking about is graphical code generator, which is a library that we as the Guild are maintaining. And to start with, I just want to ask some questions and people to raise their hands. So who here has worked with GraphQL clients? Okay, almost everyone. So who used tools here for generating code from GraphQL? No, also almost everyone. So who used Relay Compiler? No, about half the people. And who used GraphQL Code Generator? No, even more people. Okay, cool. So fun fact, uh, GraphQL Code Generator got me my current job. And how that started was uh, around 2019, so I was using Graphical Code Generator at my last company, and I was just not happy with the types, especially about uh, union and interfaces. Uh, so I started contributing, and what started as one PR eventually led to many PRs, and at some point I got a job offer, and I took the opportunity. So today I wanna talk about uh, my learnings from the last four years on working on Graphical Code Generator and also how the code generation process in those four years has uh, changed, or yes. So GraphQL was released around 2015 to 2016, and when it was first released, like TypeScript wasn't that big of a thing. So there was TypeScript, but uh, it was still a bit tricky. So uh, yeah, both GraphQL and TypeScript were in their early adoption stages. Everyone who used Create React App at that time and wanted to plug in TypeScript probably knows the pain. And yeah, so the only way at that time for like getting type safe GraphQL was to manually write your typings. So you had to like write first write your GraphQL query, then write your TypeScript type for the, for the query, and then manually annotate it within your code. And the issue here is that if you make an issue or like make a typo, write the wrong type, basically you can get a runtime exception when you execute the code because what you wrote is not representing the real world. So this is a very error prone process. Then in 2017, uh, we entered the generated typings era. And what happened there is that we had the first graphical code generator release. And finally we could like use first of all the SDL of the GraphQL schema and also the GraphQL operations for generating types for the specific GraphQL operations. So what you do, did instead is then run your code generation tool, import the types for your GraphQL operation and then within your code use the generated types. So we basically automated the process of um, writing the type definitions for our GraphQL operation manually and we also reduce the human error because we don't make mistakes. The machine probably, hopefully, make, does not make any mistakes. The only issue that is left is that we might annotate the graphical call with the wrong type, but yeah. So then, uh, in 2018 to 2019, things further changed. Why? Because something happened in the ReactJS ecosystem. So far, we only generated uh, typings, like types, but then after React started adopting hooks, uh, we rethought how graphical code generator works and instead we started to generate actual code instead of only typings and that looked like the following. So people started moving their GraphQL operations from code into dedicated GraphQL files and then we used those as the uh, generation input for generating typed hooks. And then in our application code, we would import those hooks that are generated from a GraphQL operation and then use them in our UI components. So that means we no longer had to manually annotate and import our types and annotate them where they are actually used within the code. All we need to do is just write our .graphql file and then we get the typed uh, function back that we can just use anywhere and uh, from that, we also make sure that we always get the right typing because it's basically baked in. Mm. So we were in this kind of stage. So 
people started adopting it, we were using it with our clients' projects. But over time, we made some further observa observa observations uh, with what we had. And these were, first of all, that most GraphQL clients uh, supported using TypeScript generics for variable and execution result types. So this is what we used before. We now still use that, but we were wrapping it in GraphQL hooks, uh, not GraphQL hooks, React hooks, or if we, for Vue.js, their counterpart of hooks. And then also most of the GraphQL clients were using the GraphQL AST for doing normalized caching. And in addition to that, we as the guild were maintaining a lot of plugins that all kind of did a similar thing, but kind of not. Because like every like framework library combination had like different flavors and we had to kind of like build the uh, code for everyone, uh, every single one of those. So we started to think like, okay, given these observations, how could we reduce the redundant code over all our libraries and reduce the amount of plugins that we need to maintain? And basically the solution to this problem was, okay, what if we, instead of like generating types and generating hooks, just embed the GraphQL types for the execution result and the variable in the document node, which is basically the AST, which is a type from the GraphQL JS library. And that is basically what we did. And from that, we kind of like moved to this stage where we generated, we still had like a GraphQL query. From the GraphQL query, we, instead of emitting hooks, we just emit the AST. And then we annotate the AST to be a type document node. And within the type document node, we then have the types for the um, GraphQL operation execution result, but also the variable. And then, in your actual library code, you can use this type for like extracting the variable type and the execution result type, and then build a fully typed function that you would just pass the uh, document node and then the variables. So what we kind of like created is a blueprint for integrating type safety into uh, any GraphQL client. And we reached out to the most popular ones that performed on these three like uh, things, so Apollo Client, Urkel, and GraphQL Request. And by that, uh, we kind of achieved that all of them support this. So for us, that meant that we can sunset a lot of GraphQL plugins, and instead, all of them can use this new approach. So that was roughly around 2020, and we're still in the generated code phase, but instead of like, generating uh, GraphQL hooks, we now generate AST that is typed, and then all the libraries could just infer those types from the AST objects. Oh, and an additional uh, benefit is also that we can skip the GraphQL operation parsing on the client, because why should we ship a GraphQL parser to our front end? So things changed a bit, but over time, we adopted that with our client projects. We got feedback from the community, and then we made some further observations. Observations. So first of them is zombie code. So people kind of started moving GraphQL operations into .GraphQL files because we were not actively using them with our TypeScript types. They were dead variables within the TypeScript files. But then on the other hand, people start using, uh, deleting the code where an operation is in, and they forget to delete the GraphQL file where the operation is actually defined. That means that GraphQL code generator still picks up the .GraphQL file and will still generate the AST for that object, uh, for that GraphQL operation, even though it's not used. And then also, GraphQL is also overfetching, right? Hmm. Kind of, but not if you do something like this. So I find myself guilty of doing that. Just create one file, write all your fragment, uh, fragment types for all the types that you have in your API, select all the fields, and then when you write the query, just select everything, right? Mm, that's kind of not how GraphQL was meant to be for UI components. So 
what if instead of like going top down, we could go the other way around and describe UI components with fragments. So this is like an avatar component. So all we need to render this avatar component is the avatar URL that would be available on a user. So we could define an avatar user fragment that only selects that field. Then if we go one level higher, we could have a friend list item. Friend list item would use an avatar and it would also add the name of the user next to it. So the data requirements of this component could be described by combining the previous fragment and also adding additional data requirement for the name, which is the friend list item user fragment. And then on the last level, for example in the user list or friend list, we can automatically reuse the fragment that we defined before to compose it into a highly specified graphical query operation that will only fetch the data that we need for rendering this UI component or uh, page, depending on how high we uh, use this pattern. So this basically just solves two problems. Uh, and this is called fragment and operation collocation. So if we define our data uh, requirements next to our UI components with a fragment, we solve this zombie code problem. And also, we strictly define the data needs of our components. That means that later on, we won't fetch too much data for rendering this component. And then on the next level, we would do, still do the same. We again declare our fragment that defines which fields we need to render this component. And then we also pass down the additional components, uh, properties that we need to render the other components in the component tree that all consume GraphQL data. This, uh, we again would do that up to the highest level. And there we would only then fetch the data once for here with a Apollo client using the use query hook. And yeah. So by doing this, we basically have no zombie code and we also have no overfetching because we explicitly define the data requirements of the components and we also compose all the fragments into a single graphical operation that is highly specified for only fetching the data that we actually need for our view. And I'm happy to say, uh, tell you that this is now available as the graphical code, uh, code generator client preset and if you are not aware of this yet, I highly recommend you to check that out if you're using GraphQL Code Generator for applications. And furthermore, I also wanna say that there's even more than that, but I'm not gonna go into detail of that right now because the time is limited. But you should definitely check out Relay and Houdini because instead of only like generating types for your uh, GraphQL API, they can generate much more like refetch logic and so much more. You should check it out. Um, thank you. And maybe we have time for some questions. No question? Okay, cool. One question. Sorry? Oh. <laughs> Interesting question. Um, I mean, there's some additional features built in like uh, persistent operations. So what it can do is like automatically generate your JSON file with all the GraphQL operations that you have within your uh, code and then it will also embed a property within the AST of the document that contains the query hash. So it makes it super easy to implement persistent operations with like any GraphQL client. Yeah, this is like one of the features that we recently added. <laughs> but for the future, I think this approach is now pretty feature complete. And the next step would be like, as I said, what Relay and Houdini do, doing is like, built on top of that, like highly specialized code for frameworks. But since GraphQL Code Generator, and especially this preset is like aimed to be like a broad preset, it would be the wrong approach to do 
these kind of specialized things within GraphQL code generator, client presets. 